Allison family as father and son took the checkered flag first and second. Just a few years later, tragedy hit the Allison family. Only four months after the father-son one-two finish at Daytona, Bobby was seriously injured in an accident at Pocono Raceway in Pennsylvania. His driving career was ended, and it was years before he was able to do anything resembling a normal life. Almost before the family could begin to recover from that blow, Clifford Allison, the younger son of Bobby and Judy, was lost when his NASCAR Bush Series stock car crashed at Michigan International Speedway, August 1992. The next year, the Allison family would again be rocked by tragedy. The day after he finished third at New Hampshire in what would be his final race, Davy Allison lost control of the helicopter he was flying as he attempted to land in the infield at Alabama's Talladega Super Speedway. Allison, 32, suffered fatal injuries in the crash. Passenger Red Farmer was less seriously injured. Not only was it in the end of Allison's brilliant but brief career, it ended a long presence of the Allison family name in NASCAR racing. The Earnhardt. Perhaps no name in NASCAR today evokes such strong sentiment as Earnhardt. And the Earnhardt name starts with Ralph Earnhardt, arguably the most intimidating driver of his generation. Winner of the 1956 Sportsman Championship, Ralph once racked up 17 wins in a row at North Carolina's Hickory Motor Speedway. His five track championships at Hickory were the stuff legends are made of. You could say that Hickory was Ralph Earnhardt's track. Competing in his first Grand National race at Hickory, Ralph won the pole and posted a second place finish. In the 50s and 60s, there were few drivers with a better record on the sportsman circuit. Earnhardt seemed able to win just about any race he decided to enter, and during one stretch, he owned the championship at seven different tracks. Ralph's pre-race routine at the track, coupled with his intimidating style on the track, made him a formidable opponent. On race day, he always showed up ready to race. There was no working on the car, no last-minute adjustments, and not a lot of talk with the other racers. He was just there, ready to race. When the race started, Ralph would jump right up behind the leaders of the pack and wait for someone to make a mistake, which often happened, especially if being bumped by Ralph. Sometimes just the thought of Ralph Earnhardt behind you was enough to make a driver do something desperate and ultimately costly. Ralph started in only 51 Grand National races, earning six top five finishes and no wins. He spent most of his career in the sportsman circuit. Most experts agree that had Ralph focused instead on the big races, he would have been one of the dominant drivers there too. When NASCAR began the move from the smaller dirt tracks to the larger asphalt super speedways, Ralph focused his attention fully on the sportsman tracks. That was where his heart was and where he felt most comfortable. Ralph Earnhardt died of a heart attack in September 1973, doing something he loved, working on a race car. He left an impressive legacy in the racing world, but his greatest contribution to the sport was his son, Dale. Dale Earnhardt rose to heights of achievement and popularity unparalleled in American motor sports. While his father had built a reputation as an intimidating driver, Dale Earnhardt was known as the Intimidator. Taught by his father early on to establish your territory, Dale adopted that strategy to the extreme, and it became his trademark style. Dale never gave anyone an inch. Until his father's death, Dale had been a little unsure about his future as a driver, and occasionally explored other career avenues. But the specter of having a normal job, combined with losing the greatest influence in his life, seemed to harden Dale's resolve in becoming the best he could be in the world of racing. In 1978, Earnhardt scored his first top five finish, fourth in the Dixie 400 at Atlanta. That led to a full-time ride the next season, his first solid opportunity with a new team fielded by Californian Rod Osterland. The 27-year-old Earnhardt won his first race in the seventh race of the season at Bristol, Despite missing some races because of injuries sustained in a crash at Pocono late in the year, he rolled to Rookie of the Year honors. The next year, 1980, Dale achieved what had previously been 
unachievable. Continuing on his torrid pace, he became the first driver ever to win the Rookie Award and NASCAR Winston Cup Series Championship in consecutive seasons. He finished the year with five wins, 19 top fives, and 24 top tens. It would be the first of a record-tying seven championships for Dale, whose black number three Chevrolet Monte Carlo would become one of the most recognized symbols of NASCAR. One of the greatest tragedies in NASCAR history occurred in February 2001. In the last lap of the Daytona 500, Earnhardt was lost in an accident. Finishing first and second were two cars from the Dale Earnhardt Incorporated race team. The drivers were Michael Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt Jr. The 49-year-old Earnhardt seemed to have rebounded from a slump that left him winless in 1997. He had finished second in driver points to Bobby Labonte the year before and was set on winning a record eighth championship. Few doubted he still had the ability to achieve the eighth title, but it was not to be. The torch has been passed to Little E. Ralph Dale Earnhardt Jr., who has shown great promise. Jr. started racing at age 16, working in the service department of his dad's Chevrolet dealership in Newton, North Carolina, and maintaining his own race cars with his brother, Carrie, and sister Kelly. From 1994 to 1996, Jr. started in 113 races in the NASCAR Dodge Weekly Series late model division and came away with three wins and an astonishing 90 top 10 finishes. In 1997, Little E moved up to the NASCAR Bush Series and won consecutive championships in 1998 and 99. The next year as a rookie in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series, he got two victories plus a win in the Winston, NASCAR's all-star race. He was the first rookie to win the special non-points event. Meanwhile, brother Kerry has landed a full-time NASCAR Bush Series ride with a team co-owned by former Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Terry Bradshaw. The Earnhardt name lives on in its third generation. The Jared. Contemporary race fans know Ned Jarrett as a prominent television and radio commentator. Most know that Jarrett, now retired from his broadcasting career, won two NASCAR Winston Cup Series championship titles, and that his son Dale is one of the top stars of the sport. The Jarrett family's roots in the sport are deep. Ned, showing an early knack for making money from various business ventures, took his business-like approach to the fledgling sport of stock car racing in the 1950s. He became one of the top drivers in the sport before retiring at the peak of his career in 1966. Ned had a style that was markedly different from many other drivers of his era. He preferred to think his way through a race instead of relying on sheer muscle. Over the years, he was tagged with the nickname Gentleman Ned for his non-confrontational way of winning races. It seemed to work for Ned. By the end of the 50s, he had won two sportsman championships. Like most every move he made, Jarrett's decision to try the Grand National ranks was a logical business-based decision. Jarrett was making good money racing in the sportsman division, but felt there was a bigger prize to be had in the long run in Grand National. In 1961, Ned won the championship title. That led to a relationship with Ford and a secure place among the factory-backed drivers who dominated the sport in the 1960s. Jared, driving for brothers Bondi, Walter, and Nicky Long of Camden, South Carolina, had his best season in 1965, winning 13 races, including the Southern 500, by a whopping 14 laps over second place Buck Baker in capturing his second championship. The next year, Ned began to look beyond racing and toward the security of his family. At the young age of 34, Ned Jarrett retired from competitive racing after October's race at Rockingham. He is the only driver ever to retire as the defending NASCAR Grand National Champion. Growing up in the Jarrett household meant spending many afternoons at the track. Such was the norm for Glenn and Dale Jarrett and their sister Patty. Both sons would follow in their father's footsteps. Glenn gave racing a try and then turned to broadcasting, while Dale, a star athlete in high school, turned to local short track racing. Like his father, Dale ran his first race at Hickory in 1977. He won the Limited Sportsman Division Rookie of the Year at that track. Dale's career had begun. In 1982, Dale was a regular in the NASCAR Bush Series. 
It was soon obvious that Dale had a lot of the characteristics of his father, the same intelligent, reasoned approach to racing that had made Ned Jarrett a legend. Joining the Wood Brothers, Dale won his first NASCAR Winston Cup Series race at the Michigan International Speedway in 1991. Then in 1992, his big break came when he was asked to race for former Washington Redskins coach Joe Gibbs. The arrangement proved to be a good one. That next year, Dale qualified second for the Daytona 500. This set the stage for one of the most poignant moments in NASCAR history and a truly memorable one for the Jarrett family. With Ned Jarrett in the booth announcing the race, his son held off the challenges of NASCAR's famous intimidator, Dale Earnhardt, and narrowly won this most prestigious of races. It was a tearful, joyous moment as Ned watched his son cross the finish line. In the coming years, the scene would be repeated as Dale Jarrett picked up second and third wins in the Daytona Classic. In 1999, Dale had his best year ever and won the NASCAR Winston Cup Series Championship. Together with his dad, they became only the second father-son duo to win the championship, joining Lee and Richard Petty. In 1991, carrying on the Jarrett legacy, Jason, Dale's son, entered racing. Like his father and his grandfather, Jason found himself racing at Hickory also. And in 1994, Jason won Hickory's Limited Sportsman Division Rookie of the Year Award, just like his father. The Petties. Lee Petty started racing at a time when you drove to the track in the car you were going to race, and then drove home in the same car afterward, if it was still in one piece. And that wasn't always the case. In the first NASCAR race ever, an event held at a three-quarter mile dirt track in Charlotte, North Carolina, Petty borrowed a Buick from a friend, drove it to the track, and entered it in the race. Everything went well until the sway bar came off and the car rolled several times. Petty was relatively unhurt, but the car had to be taken away on a flatbed truck. Although the outcome of this race was unfortunate for Lee Petty, it also marked the beginning of a long and successful career that would help shape NASCAR as we know it today and eventually call his sons, grandson, and even great-grandson. After the race in Charlotte, realizing that he had needed something more substantial than an old borrowed car to win races, Lee Petty bought a 1949 Plymouth and entered the business of racing. Petty Enterprises was off and running. During the first 11 years of NASCAR's existence, Lee Petty never finished a season lower than fourth in points. In 1959, he became the first three-time Grand National Champion. That same year, Lee won the inaugural Daytona 500 in a finish that was so close, it required three days to confirm him as the winner. In his first NASCAR Grand National race in 1958, Richard Petty, Lee's son, was introduced to a side of his father he had never seen, that of a competitor. As Lee Petty and Cotton Owens were battling for position, they came upon young Richard, whom they were in the process of lapping. Apparently, Richard didn't move out of the way fast enough. He was unceremoniously knocked into the wall by his father, who went on to win his second Grand National title that year. A lesson learned. At Charlotte in 1960, Richard Petty was desperately clinging on to a narrow lead over challenger Rex White. Suddenly, a skirmish developed between White and Lee Petty, and Richard was able to use the distraction to his advantage by lengthening his lead and eventually winning the race. That year, Richard finished second in the run for the Grand National title. In February 1961, Lee and Richard Petty were both involved in spectacular crashes during the 100-mile qualifying races prior to the Daytona 500. Lee was seriously injured, and his driving career was all but ended. Richard and his brother Maurice took on the mantle of responsibility for the family business. For a while, Maurice tried his hand at driving, but quickly decided that his skills were behind the scenes building engines, not driving. Richard was the driver. And so in 1962, Richard and Maurice began one of the most phenomenal runs in NASCAR history. In the next three years, Richard finished second in the NASCAR Grand National Championship for two consecutive years before winning his first title in 1964.
During that time, he won 31 races with 121 top tens, including the 1964 Daytona 500, and collected over $100,000 for the first time in his career. In 1967, when there were as many as 60 or more races each year, Richard Petty accomplished a feat that likely will never be equaled in NASCAR. He won 27 of 48 starts, including a victory streak of 10 races in a row. Petty won his second championship that year and began to be known as King Richard. Things continued well for Petty through 1979 when he won his seventh championship. That was the year that a new Petty emerged on the scene, Richard's son, Kyle. A more easygoing and liberal personality than his father, Kyle Petty began his career by winning an ARCA race just days before the Daytona 500, which his father won by holding off Darrell Waltrip on the last lap. It was the sixth of seven Daytona 500s that Petty would claim. He would go on to capture his seventh NASCAR Winston Cup Series championship title. Richard Petty's last year of racing was 1992. At age 55, he had accumulated 200 NASCAR Winston Cup victories. He was also the first driver to earn over a million dollars in racing, having reached that plateau in 1971. In 1989, Kyle had signed on with millionaire and racing aficionado Felix Sabatis, and the number of wins began to increase. His success with Sabatis included two fifth-place Winston Cup Series points finishes. Then in 1991, at a race in Talladega, Kyle sustained a broken leg, which sidelined him for half the season. Perhaps this was an indication of things to come. After he recovered, Kyle spent a few more seasons with Sabatis, and then things started downhill. After several mediocre seasons and only one win, Kyle left Sabatis. In 1997, Kyle Petty rejoined the family business. It would be soon after this long-awaited reunion that another Petty would begin his brief but colorful career. Kyle's son Adam becoming the first fourth generation sports figure. Adam raced short track late model stock cars before moving up to a regional series and he won his first race in June 1998. A few months later Adam entered his first race on a major speedway, an ARCA stock car event at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Like his dad had done in 1979, Adam won his ARCA debut and thus became that series youngest winner. Adam made his NASCAR Winston Cup Series debut at Texas Motor Speedway in April 2000. It looked as if the newest member of the Petty Racing Clan was in the earliest stages of a long and successful racing career. Adam was to be the centerpiece of the Petty Enterprises team as it returned to Dodge in 2001. But it was not to be. In May of 2000, Adam Petty was lost while taking a practice run at New Hampshire International Speedway. The accident closed prematurely another chapter in the remarkable history of the Petty family. Behind the scenes. Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. In 1982, NASCAR officials reorganized the NASCAR Sportsman Division into what is now the NASCAR Bush Series, a touring league one step below the Premier Series. Dale Earnhardt was a regular competitor in the series and formed his own team to field cars in the Junior Series. That team grew into Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. Earnhardt won the first race in the new series at Daytona in February 1982. In the 12 years that followed, Earnhardt's team won 21 races, including six Daytona 300s. The overwhelming success of his team convinced the owner to branch out into the other major divisions of NASCAR Craftsman Truck and Winston Cup. Although Earnhardt was committed to finishing his own career driving for Richard Childress Racing, it was time for the Dale Earnhardt Incorporated team to move up to the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. After a few trial events in 1996 and 97, the team became a full-time participant in 1998 with Park as the driver. Earnhardt's son, Dale Jr., took over the driving responsibilities in the NASCAR Bush Series. Park's rookie season was derailed when he was hurt in an accident at Atlanta. Dale Jr. and Hornaday, however, did quite well, winning the title in their respective divisions. 
needing a replacement driver for his NASCAR Winston Cup car, Earnhardt signed Darrell Waltrip, who responded by giving the new team their first top five and top ten finishes. In 1999, things just got better, and Dale Jr. won his second NASCAR Busch Series championship. His success led Dale Sr. to agree to a five-race NASCAR Winston Cup introduction for the younger Earnhardt, driving a Budweiser-sponsored car. The year 2000 marked the first victories for the NASCAR Winston Cup team, with Earnhardt Jr. claiming victories at Texas and Richmond, and Park also getting a win at Watkins Glen. A third team was to be added in 2001 with Michael Waltrip as the driver. In the first race of the year, the Daytona 500, Waltrip won his first victory, but Earnhardt lost his life in an accident on the final lap. Dale Jr., devastated by the death of his father, somehow went on to win three races that year, including the July race at Daytona, and finished in the top ten in final point standings. The team continues under the direction of Earnhardt's widow, Teresa, and has established itself as one of the top operations in racing. Hendrick Motorsports. When car dealer and former boat racer Rick Hendrick formed his own stock car team in 1984, he hired the best people he could to make his dream a reality. Legendary crew chief Harry Hyde was picked to build up the team, and Jeff Bodine, a former standout in modified racing in the Northeast, was chosen as the driver. With all the other great teams out there under names like Johnson, Melling, Childress, and Moore, the new Hendrick team faced a monumental task, but they faced it well. And in just their eighth start, Bodine drove to victory lane. This was the beginning of the great team known as Hendrick Motorsports. Hendrick beefed up his facilities and crew for the 1986 season and added Tim Richmond as a second driver. That year, the duo won nine out of 29 races. Hendrick, not one to rest on his laurels, continued adding to his organization and by 1987 was fielding as many as five cars in a single race. Darrell Waltrip and Benny Parsons were added to the stable of drivers, and Hendrick Motorsports became a very formidable opponent. In the early 1990s, Hendrick made one of his best acquisitions, Jeff Gordon. Gordon had been phenomenal in USAC open-wheel racing and moved to NASCAR in 1990. He drove Fords for Bill Davis Racing in 1991 and 92, but moved into a Hendrick Chevrolet for his debut race in the 1992 season finale at Atlanta. Gordon won Rookie of the Year honors in 1993 and picked up his first two victories the next year. In 1995, he won the team's first championship title. The following year, Terry Labonte added another Winston Cup title to the team. This was only the second time in NASCAR history that an owner had won back-to-back -back titles with different drivers. Gordon would capture two more championships in 1997 and 98 Except for Dale Earnhardt's stretch of four titles in five years from 1990 through 94, it was the best performance since David Pearson did it back in 1966, 68, and 69, winning three titles in those four years. In 1995 and 96, Hendrick Motorsports won 22 out of 62 races, including four events during 1996 in which their teams finished first and second. Hendrick faced a personal setback in 1996 when it was discovered that he had leukemia. During his battle with the disease, he witnessed one of the best races ever for his team, the 1997 Daytona 500, when his cars took first, second, and third place. After his recovery, Hendrick again took it all when Gordon won the 2001 Winston Cup Series Championship. In seven years, Hendrick's teams won the championship an astounding five times. Going into 2003, Hendrick Motorsports claimed 109 Winston Cup victories, third on the all-time list. Junior Johnson Racing. Junior Johnson was one of NASCAR's early star drivers, but it was after his driving career when he decided to move to the other side of pit wall after his last race in 1966, that the former moonshiner really dominated the world of motorsports. Johnson, hailing from 
Ronda, North Carolina, won 50 races as a driver, including the second Daytona 500 in 1960. He thrilled crowds with his wide open style, but as a team owner, Johnson enjoyed even better success, winning 139 races and six championships. Drivers such as Darrell Deeringer, Leroy Yarbrough, Charlie Glotchback, and Bobby Allison helped establish Johnson's team as one of the best in NASCAR. But Cale Yarbrough and Darrell Waltrip secured the team's lofty status. Yarbrough won 55 of his 83 career victories in Johnson's cars and became the only driver to win three straight NASCAR Winston Cup Series championships in 1976, 77, and 78. Waltrip won 43 of his 84 career victories and took championship honors in 1981, 82, and 85, driving for Johnson as well. With Ford and Chrysler out of racing, Johnson and Charlotte Motor Speedway promoter Richard Howard joined forces to help lure Chevrolet into the sport. Johnson is also credited with getting officials of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, makers of Winston Cigarettes, together with NASCAR officials, setting up one of the most successful partnerships in all of American sports. In 1996, Johnson sold his operation to Brett Bodine and disappeared from the NASCAR scene. Richard Childress Racing. Richard Childress went from track peanut bender to one of the top independent team owners in NASCAR. Childress used to sell peanuts and watch races at Bowman Gray Stadium in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He started his NASCAR career working on cars and driving them on the quarter-mile paved track that surrounded a football field. In 1972, with longtime friend Tim Brewer, Childress started racing NASCAR Winston Cup Series stock cars. In the seven years that followed, they became one of NASCAR's premier independent teams. But Childress, although highly skilled as an organizer and manager, was not the driver he needed to be in the competitive ranks of NASCAR's elite. Realizing this, Childress stepped back from driving to focus on running the team. But now, they needed a driver. Childress recruited a bright young star to finish the last 11 races of the 1981 season, Dale Earnhardt, whose 1980 championship ride with Rod Osterland had come unraveled. After season's end, Childress encouraged Earnhardt to accept an opportunity to drive for the more established Bud Moore team, which benefited from a significant factory contribution. Stuck without a driver again, Childress hired up-and-coming Ricky Rudd. Together for two seasons, Childress and Rudd saw success. Their first win came at the Riverside track in June of 1983, and another victory followed in the fall at Martinsville. Finally, things were starting to work for Childress. In 1984, Earnhardt and Childress were reunited, and things really took off. Earnhardt wasted no time in grabbing victories at Talladega and Atlanta. But that was just a warm-up. With Earnhardt as his driver, Childress saw six NASCAR Winston Cup Series championships. In that time, first with sponsorship from Wrangler Jeans and later from General Motors GM Goodrich brand, RCR grew and evolved into one of the best in the business. A second car was added with Mike Skinner being promoted from Childress NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series championship winning team. Even though he had formed his own race team, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, Earnhardt intended to finish his career driving Childress's cars. The end came tragically and prematurely when Earnhardt was lost at Daytona in February 2001. Rookie Kevin Harvick driving for the NASCAR Busch Series entry in the Childress stable and scheduled to drive a third RCR Cup entry in 2002 was picked to drive the cars that had been prepared for Earnhardt. He turned in a stellar performance, winning two races and finishing in the top ten final point standings. He also ran full-time in the NASCAR Busch Series car, winning that series championship and thus giving Childress championship titles in all three of NASCAR's top divisions. The third team came online as scheduled in 2002 with Jeff Green, the driver. Robbie Gordon replaced Skinner in the number 31 RCR Chevrolet and Harvick continues to drive the GM Goodwrench entry, which has carried the number 29 instead of Earnhardt's famous number 3. The Childress Earnhardt tandem remains one of the most lucrative owner driver relationships with earnings of over $54 million. Racing in the New Millennium.
Kurt Busch. In September of 2000, Kurt Busch made his first Winston Cup Series start, driving a Roush Ford at Dover. He performed well enough in that race to convince Roush that the Winston Cup Series is where he belonged. So while most drivers had to first pay their dues by moving up through the Busch Series ranks, Busch jumped full-time into the Winston Cup Series with minimal experience. Busch responded by finishing second in the Rookie of the Year competition. Now, Bush knew that he needed to gain as much experience as possible to have a successful second year in NASCAR's top series. His prayers were answered when Roush shuffled his teams up before the 2002 season even started. Bush's team went to Mark Martin, and Martin's team went to Bush, along with crew chief Jimmy Fennig. This gave Martin a successful crew and positioned sophomore Kurt Bush with a more experienced team. Now, halfway through the season, it was obvious that the changes produced resounding success. Martin was second in the point standings, while Bush fared ninth. With less than two years in the Winston Cup Series, Kurt Busch has already evolved from a newcomer trying to fit into the NASCAR world to a recognized legitimate threat on the track. He credits at least some of his quick rise among the racing world's elite to a couple of accomplishments in 2001 winning the pole at the Southern 500 and achieving his first Winston Cup victory at the Food City 500 at Bristol. Now even though Bush